a different world. Everybody out on the fence. With its own rules, often justice in their own hands. In there, in the pool, we drown the sex offenders. Zero tolerance. Back to your cells. Gangs, violence, drugs. You can get all drugs inside. And harassment. I did it to make it tough. And inhumane conditions. All this behind bars. In the toughest prisons in the world. La Paz, Bolivia. 3,700 meters above sea level, the highest seat of government in the world. In the city in the Andes mountain gorge, besides politics, two things and two things only rule. Poverty and crime. Bolivia is the second poorest country in South America, the third largest cocaine producer in the world. Almost 50% of Bolivians live below the poverty line. Those who are even poor and or criminals end up in La Paz, in this place. In San Pedro, in the forecourt to hell, in a city within a city, in the prison city. Perhaps the most unusual prison in the world and certainly one of the toughest. This is San Pedro, a prison where no guards dare venture inside. There are 20 of us and more than 2,000 of them. Behind those walls, pure anarchy. A lawless place where only the strongest survive. I am a murderer. I killed a cop. Physical and psychological insanity. I'm afraid of losing myself here. Anything and everything is available in here. We have all the drugs in here that you can get outside. An absurd location. Between rapists, pedophiles and drug addicts. Countless women and children. This is San Pedro. One of the toughest prisons in the world. Seven o'clock in the morning. Hustle and bustle at the entrance of San Pedro. Although the prison city is considered hopelessly overcrowded, new criminals wash up against prison gates almost daily. Nobody goes in there voluntarily because everybody knows that hell awaits behind these 18 meter high walls. Carlos Gallegos knows as well. The reason for his incarceration, armed robbery. One at a time, Carlos and the other arrivals file past the prison guards. I'm kind of scared because I do not know what will happen to me. Although I've been in jail before, I was never in here. This is my first time here. San Pedro is unlike any other prison in the world. Police officer Iban Quispe will be the last contact with any officials of the Bolivian executive for the newcomers for a long time. After this, it's every man for himself. Kispe is admitting 10 new prisoners today. Do you have any tattoos? No. Tattoos can be an indication of gang membership. The police wants to at least know who comes in here. Mara Salvatrucha reigns in Bolivia, one of the most dangerous and notorious gangs in the world, with almost 100,000 members throughout Latin America. Final fingerprints. And mug shots. That's it. Police work is done. From now on, the prisoners take over. My work is done here. 
Then he goes in there, the delegados will take over. They decide what happens to him. The lords of the prisons, the so-called delegados, rule supreme in here. Everything, anytime. Just a few more meters through a confusing tunnel system, then it ends. The area of influence of the judiciary and police. After that, vigilantism rules. The world's toughest prison without guards inside. In San Pedro, the prisoners are left entirely to themselves. The state stays out of it. Unoccupied watchtowers. No guards, no police, nothing. Instead, prison bosses rise from the ranks of the prisoners. Murderers, violent criminals and drug lords. They govern the eight districts of San Pedro. They make sure that the completely dilapidated prison town here in the middle of the city, located in one of the best neighborhoods of La Paz, doesn't get completely out of hand. Within the walls, inmates move about freely, junkies, rapists, and murderers, all together. It was back in 2002 that the government made the unusual decision to leave the prison and its inmates entirely to their own devices. Since then, the inmates take care of everything themselves. Government sells this as a progressive and integrative system. In reality, this dirt poor country is just trying to save on prison costs. The state doesn't take care of anything anymore. The government has cast San Pedro aside. In plain terms, the inmates take care of everything. They cook their own meals, they build the cells and try to keep the prison from falling apart completely, patching up as best they can what is in deep disrepair. A city within a city, full of outlaws. Women bring in the goods, bread, cocaine, and building materials. The prisoners rule supreme inside, and kings among thieves and murderers are the bosses. They alone determine who gets what, who lives where within these walls. An absurd and tough microcosm, abiding by its own rules and laws. For this is San Pedro, one of the toughest and most dangerous prisons in the world. Everybody knows it here. The new guys know it. Carlos knows it. A little. What should I say? I'd have it easier someplace else. This place, this is just weird. Scary. Some of the other guys have already told me stories. I kind of know what to expect. This isn't the first time in prison for Carlos, but it's the first time for him in San Pedro. On the outside, he's a tough guy. Only time will tell how tough he really is on the inside. Within the walls of San Pedro, a few meters more until that last gate, the gate to hell. The gate where police oversight ends and the rule of the delegados begins. A free man when he came in, once the door closes behind him, Carlos is a free man no longer. He is a prisoner of San Pedro, a prison which no guard enters voluntarily. The prisoners rule behind bars, specifically the prison bosses, the so-called delegados. Victor Hugo Mendoza, a name every newbie would do well to remember, for he is the boss of all bosses here. Convicted of four murders, he is the head of the delegados. Send over the disciplinas. Gather round and bring me the new guys. Mendoza carefully takes in each newcomer. As prison king, he has the first word, and he has the last word. The new one here is only a prisoner when I decide he's a prisoner. I explain the rules of conduct in this penitentiary. This helps avoid problems later on. Problems that may not only make the newcomer's life difficult, but could make his survival here impossible. The delegados escort Carlos in, leading him up to the prison boss. Is this the new man? It's him, boss. All right. 
Gallegos, Luis Carlos Agosto, listen to me carefully. These are the rules of this prison. In this prison, the inmates make the rules themselves. And the most important thing here is, above all else, respect. Everybody listens to the delegados. In San Pedro, there are a total of eight quarters. The bosses decide who lives where. Once you are assigned your quarter, it is impossible to change. Each quarter has a certain reputation. One quarter houses the ones who rule, the powerful. In another quarter, the fixers. Only if Carlos can scrape together enough money will he survive. His sleeping area, his food, everything has a price tag on it. Totally intimidated by now, the newcomer is too scared to ask any questions. The delegados assess him according to his crime, his age, his sentence. The boss gives the signal to take him away. Carlos himself has no idea what is going to happen to him. The delegados lead him down one of the many dark passages. Luis Carlos Argusto Gallego is from now under the rule of the highest ranking criminal. This is the last time we can film him. A day later, Carlos is not allowed to talk to us anymore. His body is covered with bruises. How it happened and why, no one outside these walls will ever find out. San Pedro is probably the only prison in the world where the policemen and guards do not enter. In fact, the prison guards don't care what happens on the inside. An easy way to get by. He who sees nothing, knows nothing. The power of the police force here does not extend beyond a four by four meter area. The area where visitors come in, show their IDs, are security checked and escorted through the door into the actual prison area. That's it. Police Chief Christian Sajines has been working here for eight years now. As chief of police, he should have control of the entire prison, but San Pedro is different. The delegados let us know if something has happened in the prison. They also determine the penalties for crimes. We act as an executive power only. Sajines is pragmatic, frighteningly so. There are 20 of us and 2,000 of them, 20 police officers for more than 2,000 prisoners. We're powerless. We can't do anything. How helpless the police really are is documented by this video filmed in 2014. It shows one of the worst riots. Riots like that happen all the time. All the police can do is watch and make sure the riots and unrest do not spread beyond the walls into the city. There just aren't enough of us. The situation is intolerable. This concept was established many years ago. But at that time, there were fewer prisoners, and now circumstances have changed. I think that this here will end very badly. In the event of an emergency, we can do nothing. An absurd microcosm, and a hopelessly outnumbered police chief. Power to the majority, power to the prisoners, especially the delegados, all convicted felons. Their favorite hangout, the parapet from which they can see over the entire prison area. These men are respected and feared at the same time, because when it comes down to it, it is they who decide over life and death. First and foremost, Victor Hugo Mendoza, who has climbed the ranks from a quadruple murderer to prison boss. He rules through his delegados. One of them, Valentino Maiori. The distinguishing feature of delegados, black tracksuits. Each delegado is responsible for one of the quarters. If there are problems, they are supposed to intervene, but they also carry out administrative tasks of a certain kind.
Every prisoner has an entrance fee to pay. It's our job to get it. Yes, it's true. Each prisoner pays to be here. The prison bosses require a kind of protection money, 150 bolivianos or 21 US dollars. A lot of money in a country where the average income is $6.30 a day. That fee does not cover your sleeping area, though. Valentino himself lives on about five square meters. He was arrested for marijuana trafficking. He was a pothead and still is. Not a problem in San Pedro. Drugs are everywhere. Anything you can get outside, you can get it in here too. The most popular drug by far, pasta basica de cocaína. Cocaine in its first stage, it's smoked. Drugs, one of the biggest problems of San Pedro. Especially one quarter they call the drugs quarter, but honestly, drugs are everywhere in San Pedro. Approximately 60% of the inmates are drug addicts. They chew on coca leaves soaked in chemicals. They sniff crack or pure cocaine, smoke heroin or the infamous pasta basica de cocaina. Particularly popular because it's cheap, a byproduct of cocaine manufacture. The dangerous thing about it, in addition to psychosis and paranoia, it suppresses hunger. Users either starve to death or go mad. The obvious and outright drug dealing, excessive consumption and the misery of drug addicts, all this happens under the watchful eyes of the delegados. Nobody says anything in front of the camera, but many claim it's the delegados who control the drug business here. He who has the drugs has the power. San Pedro as a microcosm reflects the problem of the whole country. Experts estimate one in three Bolivians regularly takes drugs. 21 tons of cocaine alone were seized last year, and nobody knows the exact figure or amount of cocaine that wasn't seized by law enforcement. However, Experts estimate cocaine exports last year rose from 290 to 420 tons. One gram of cocaine costs you between 10 and $20 in La Paz. A country on a permanent high, wired, a land lost in drugs and crime. A country that attracts adventurers from around the world. like Javier Blanco Alvarez, called Blanco. He's 38 years old and comes from a small Spanish village. He's been in San Pedro for seven years now. Like many foreigners inside Bolivian prisons, he is there for a drug-related crime. You get drugs on every corner in La Paz. I'm here for drug smuggling. I was pulled out by the police at the airport. They found the drugs at the bottom of my suitcase. Two kilograms of cocaine. In Bolivia, suspected drug abuse is enough to get you arrested. According to Bolivian law, the prosecutor does not have to prove guilt. The accused must prove his or her innocence. Often a futile exercise, for Blanco anyway. So he sits in San Pedro and knows exactly how drugs turn people into zombies. For more than four years now, he is afraid to venture outside of his cell. Better off alone than in bad company. I've been living this way for years now. I don't need anyone. You don't see it right away, but everyone just wants to steal from you. They're like, hey pal, how are you? While behind your back, they rob you blind. I'm my own best friend, next to Lupita. Blanco earns his money doing woodwork. He sells furniture to other inmates to somehow keep afloat. San Pedro, Blanco's 24-7 nightmare. Until he gets out, he lives in constant fear of being robbed, or worse, and is ready for anything. 
I can defend myself. I either use a spatula or some other tool. If someone makes trouble, then I'll just stab him. That's it. Stabbings are a daily reality in San Pedro. Blanco does not want to leave his four walls, and he has found a solution for everything. This is my toilet. It takes way too long to get to the toilets, and I don't go out at night. He empties his toilet on the roof because he doesn't feel safe down below in the dark and dank corridors of San Pedro. Too many addicts, too many aggressive people. And in between this chaos of human despair, children, approximately 300 of them, inmates of San Pedro may bring their families with them to prison. But because their parents are occupied during the day trying to make ends meet, earning money any way they can, most of the children are left to their own devices. One of the women who live here is Michelle Benduso Hurtado. Her daughter, Escalet, is only five months old. And the youngest resident of San Pedro so far. Michelle's husband, César, is imprisoned for armed robbery. Michelle is not a criminal, lives here in San Pedro voluntarily. Financial constraints and fear for her family have brought her here. When my husband got arrested, we had to give up our old apartment. My husband decided that from now on, we would live here together. We're like his key point, his strength, so he can survive here. The family of three lives in a six-square-meter room. It was really difficult to set everything up, to make it comfortable for us. This room looked completely different, was full of trash. We barely had space to walk around. We have a pet rat, and there are cockroaches. We always have to pay attention that they don't bite my baby girl or go after her food. The inmates of San Pedro cannot choose in which room they want to live. They have to take what they can get. Michel has managed to make the small room habitable, but the real dangers lurk outside the mini apartment. Only a few women really look after their children in here. They walk out there in the dark alleys all by themselves, pretending like it's a normal street. But this is a jail. Here there are way more dangers than outside. Michelle lives here of her own free will, but she is ashamed about her situation. The only person who knows we're in prison is my mom. The rest of my family and friends think we are on vacation. Michelle sticks by her husband, but the situation weighs heavily upon her. Despite being allowed to leave the prison twice a day for shopping and doctor visits, she still feels like a captive, innocent in jail. So why do so many families live in San Pedro? Simple, really, yet complicated. A woman living alone on the outside would barely be able to scrape through. Bolivia has no social services, so if you don't have money, you starve. On the inside, within prison walls, the families can at the very least stick together and don't have to pay rent for two places. It is a high price to pay, though, because the children lay amongst murderers and child abusers. Not that life is cheap on the inside. Who wants to survive in this cesspool of humanity needs food and protection. Protection delegados provide, and that does not come cheap. Everybody tries to get their hands on some cash. Some inmates who had a profession on the outside have an advantage. They wash, do repair work, or bake. But the weakest links, the ones who have no skills, are completely at the mercy of this tough hierarchy. Day after day, these men have to scramble to scratch together a few pennies. Some of them work as messengers, the so-called taxitas. They stand around at the entrance all day looking for those inmates who are expecting visits from the outside. 
Sí, ya ya pasó esto que mandé. Es un moica. Es un moica. David Jokes. Hay que David Jokes. Es un moica. Hay que the taxitas deliver messages or search for the prisoners who are expecting visitors. Not an easy task in the labyrinth of small, dark passages in San Pedro. They don't earn much money. Too little to survive, too much to die. Most of the inmates are poorer than they already were before they were convicted. Michel's husband, César, fights every single day to keep his small family afloat. It is not easy. Money rules daily life. I came here with 10,000 pesos. On the third day, I only had 90 left. Cesar has to pay the delegados 100 US dollars per month for the 20 square feet he occupies with his family. And if he doesn't pay, his wife and baby are out on the streets of San Pedro. Cesar and his wife get by by baking and selling cupcakes. A constant worry is keeping this small business going. His biggest concern, however, is his wife and child. It's very dangerous here, so I can't let them out of my sight. It gets even more dangerous here when it's a public holiday. Everybody drinks. On the last day of carnival, they did not respect the fact that I have a small child. They attacked me with a knife. And because I had the little one in my arms, I could not defend myself. I ran to the gate, but there was no one there, no policeman, no security, nothing. And when I complained to the police the next day, they reported me to the delegados. The police just informs the delegados. It couldn't have been worse for Cesar. The delegados punish him for his betrayal, what they consider betrayal. They beat him up. The reasoning? Nobody is to go to the police. The delegados rule and decide what's right and what's wrong. Valentino is one of the delegados, who determines that Cesar's complaint about the knife attack during Carnival was not justified. During Carnival, a lot of things happen. You have to understand. We all do our best, and everyone has problems to deal with. And when people drink during the holidays, and somebody feels provoked, tempers flare and can get out of hand. An even more volatile topic surrounds that of the sex offenders. They are considered fair game, and Valentino speaks openly about what is done to them. In there, in the pool, we drown the sex offenders. They're beaten, and then we dump them in there. That's it. During the day, it is a kid's pool, and at night, a scene of gruesome vigilantism. Again and again, inmates disappear or are found dead within these walls, mostly sex offenders. Those sex offenders who manage to survive are the dregs of San Pedro society, the scum. They are responsible for performing the most menial tasks, eating potatoes, working in the kitchen, cleaning up after everyone else, scrubbing toilets and prison cells of the more powerful inmates. One of them is Ricardo Sanchez. He raped six girls. Right after he arrived at San Pedro, the delegados sought him out. Since then, Ricardo doesn't speak anymore to anybody. He works from morning to night without earning a cent. There are many just like him. They know there is no tougher prison for sex offenders. The delegado's rule of law hovers over them constantly. Final station, San Pedro. A state within a state, a city within a city, 
a different planet, San Pedro. Vigilantism with its own rule of law. Luck of the draw, roll of the dice, drugs, and rule of the strongest. The weak lose. Those who don't comply disappear without a trace. The ones with power rule. Just like Ronald Orna, he's been in San Pedro for eight years. Cop killer, 12 year sentence. He knows his way around these walls and dark alleys, and he knows how to survive in here. Respect is paramount in a prison. Here, when a new inmate comes in and wants to prove he is a tough guy, wants to stand up to the others, then he does not show the necessary respect to the established prisoners. Your reputation is directly related to your offense. I am, for example, a murderer. And that speaks for itself, right? Who has committed what crime quickly makes the rounds in San Pedro. Here the rule applies, the more severe the crime, the greater the prestige. Cop Kiru Ronald ranks high in the hierarchy. 12 noon, lunchtime. Ronald always finds a place to sit and eat. Others don't even get enough to eat. We are a lot of people in here, almost 3,000, and many have their families with them. Everybody wants to eat, but there isn't enough for all of them. Lunch is the only free meal in prison, the only chance for the poorest among the inmates to eat anything. The midday meal is financed by the state, but there is never enough to feed everyone. Alternately, rice with plantains or broth with chicken is on the menu. Each prisoner who has received his ration is listed by name. Those who are late go hungry. There are no extras. Because the state supplies only one meal per day, San Pedro has to take care of the rest. Each day, women and relatives bring food with them to the prison. And that's how drugs enter the prison as well. The police does what it can, but is completely overwhelmed. Those who have no relatives or other support on the outside lose, and sooner or later, end up dead. Ronald usually has enough small change because he has connections to the top, to the powerful in San Pedro. I earn my money with a few services for the delegados. Earlier, we had to strike out, punish someone. Disciplinary action due to misconduct. It's something we have to do. It's common practice. It went well, though part of my routine. Hey, senor, move on. We're having a private talk here, and that guy wants to eavesdrop. He has no manners. That can't happen here. Not with me. He gets in trouble with me for that kind of behavior. Holding one's ground, demonstrating strength, that's the only way to survive in here. Originally designed to house 600 prisoners, in the meantime, 3,000 are estimated to be here. But no one knows the real numbers. That's a problem. Because again and again, people disappear, and the police has no clue what's going on. Currently, five inmates are officially listed as missing. Whether they are dead or have escaped, the police doesn't know. I have no idea what is going on in there. They do what they want inside those walls. We are not allowed to enter. Crazy and dangerous for any individual. 
Inmates like the Spaniard Blanco are left completely to their own devices. He has been in San Pedro for seven years now and is too scared to leave his cell. He knows too well that inmates regularly disappear without a trace in Bolivia's most notorious prison. I had a German friend, Stefan. Two years ago, he suddenly disappeared. The others said he committed suicide. But who knows if that's true? This is not like in Spain, where you get your cell, police everywhere, and cameras. Here, there's no one. They throw you in here, and then may God help you. If Blanco is to be believed, then you are truly at the mercy of San Pedro and its inmates. We have a lot of rapings here. In this quarter, a man abused another man's wife. But more often, men rape other men. That's why I always sleep with one eye open and keep everything else closed. Sex and prostitution, another huge issue in prison. If you don't have a girlfriend or wife in here, then you get someone from the outside and pay her. But I don't want to, and even if I did, I don't have the money. Blanco's time in prison, in one of the toughest prisons in all of South America, has left its toll. People in Europe are very selfish. You don't realize it until you go to prison. No. I'm not sad. No. I'm grateful that I was able to realize that. And should I ever return to Spain, then I can change. And I will live better with less. I will not be selfish. I've sworn that to myself in here. In Spain, I saw poor people on the streets. It didn't interest me. But here, we're all extremely poor. Money rules the world, especially in the small world of San Pedro. Corrupt through and through. Everybody needs money and everybody wants money. You pay off people to keep their mouths shut, especially when it comes to gambling. It is not allowed. But if it makes the delegados money, then even gambling and prostitution are allowed. Cell phones are not allowed here either, but you see them everywhere. And you can use them too if you bribe the right people. Money exchanges hands in the visitors area too. You want a cop to leave the room so you can have a private conversation? You need money. Whoever has the right status can even play football in San Pedro. Bonard, the cop killer, is respected and has a reputation as a tough guy. The system works for him. He has his finances under control and does lead a reasonably tolerable life in this unusual prison. Nothing is free in here. Everything costs money. Everything has to be purchased. Everything has to be paid for. Like this Coke. One simply needs money. Cop killer Ronald lives in the Pinos Quarter. Not a luxurious area of San Pedro, but significantly better than the drug quarter, for example, where aggressive crimes are pervasive. Thank you. 
Although Ronald maintains good relations with the delegados, he still has to pay rent. I sleep over there. There are inmates who have their own cell, but here, there are five of us. You know what I say? To each his own. About six square meters for five grown men. No privacy at all. But this sleeping area is still considered one of the better ones and therefore costs money, like everything else. We pay three pesos per day. We pay what we have to pay. If you don't pay up, you have the delegados on your back. And in a place where you always run into somebody, no one wants to risk that. San Pedro is hopelessly overcrowded. The size of a football field. The prison was originally meant for 600 inmates. In the meantime, it's up to 3,000. And the greater the demand for a place to sleep, the higher the price for a roof over your heads. But the people who wash up on these shores usually have barely enough money to stay afloat. Most of the money passes his hands. Victor Hugo Mendoza, prison boss, controls San Pedro. To accommodate all of his underlings, he wants to enlarge the prison and is planning a new building. I have to ensure that we get new material. We are looking for donations. There are people out there that help us. They donate money, bricks, and cement, so we can build this house. Not one cent for the new building is coming from the Bolivian government. The government has abandoned San Pedro and implemented a bold social project in 2002, a prison without guards, inmates managing it themselves. The result, a completely dilapidated prison. Many of the houses here are over 100 years old, in danger of collapse and only makeshift repairs are possible. Most of the cells are do-it-yourself because of lack of space. Those who cannot afford a place to live sleep between dirt and garbage in one of the many dark passages. Four-time murderer Mendoza is the only one who can change anything. He is not only prison boss, but building contractor as well. I am not only proud, I am glad that I and my comrades were able to implement our project. A project that sounds quite absurd upon closer inspection, because Mendoza's new prison building, once finished, will be only 10 centimeters lower than the actual prison walls. Since there is an observation tower, from there they control us. There is CCTV, so they have the outer walls under control. Empty surveillance towers and unguarded walls that are 10 centimeters high. Hugo Mendoza plays dumb. He knows exactly what he can say and what he prefers to keep to himself. It would perhaps be too much to say that I feel like a king. But up here, I feel free. I feel the wind more up here. You can feel the freedom. Down there, among all those people, it is ominous and depressing. Hugo Mendoza looks at his little kingdom as it appears to continue to grow. Because this is San Pedro in La Paz, one of the toughest prisons in South America. A prison in which no guards or police officers dare enter. Who ends up behind those bars is completely at the mercy of the ruling prisoners and their order of conduct. A prison boss, who together with his posse controls the entire prison. A prison where people disappear. Where others lock themselves in out of fear. Where a small group of people control everything. Where you either pay up or go to the dogs. A prison where drugs are ubiquitous. And in the middle of this quagmire, the innocent children are on their own.
This is San Pedro, a city within a city, a world unto itself with its own rule of law. How will it go on? Prison boss Hugo Victor Mendoza wants to continue to preside over the nearly 3,000 prisoners. His new building will probably be finished in a year. But it is really only a drop in the bucket because San Pedro is overcrowded, sixfold. The police huddled in their small office are resigned to the harsh realities. They expect things to get worse before they get better. And so their jobs remain as dangerous as ever. If they want to escape, they can. We do our best, but we can't have our eyes on everyone. We just can't monitor everything. Cop killer Ronald Orna doesn't need to escape. After 12 years in different prisons, he could soon be a free man. When I'm out of here, I'm sitting down with my family to dinner, at home, with my wife, my children, my nephews and nieces. We eat ceviche that I have prepared by myself. Cesar has about four more years ahead of him, but he has had relapses and doesn't think he can make it on his own. We need support. The people who get out of here are extremely poor. What are they going to do? Go out and steal again? Many get out on Friday and are back inside by Monday. And Blanco, to be honest, he is on the verge of losing his mind. I'm afraid of losing myself completely in here. But there will be nothing left of me. I want to get out of here. But I do not think I will ever return to Spain. Bolivia. La Paz. San Pedro. A city in a city. A state within a state. And definitely one of the toughest and most notorious prisons on the planet.